So we are going to get started here in 1 Corinthians 14. So if you want to turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 14, we're going to talk a little bit about that last verse in uh, chapter 13. And as we go along, there is a verse that's going to kind of be pointed out, um, and that would be verse 10, 1 Corinthians 13, 10. But when that which is perfect, and I want us to remember that word perfect, when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So we're going to refer back to that scripture a little bit later um, as we proceed forth. But I want to talk a little bit about this last verse, verse 13. First Corinthians 13 says, And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Now, when God fulfills the word of God, when he fulfills the mystery that he gave to Paul, and we talked about these scriptures last week, Colossians 1, 25 and 26, which lets us know that Paul's epistles are the ones that actually fulfill the word of God. They say this, Colossians 1, 25 and 26, Paul says, whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery, which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. So by that very scripture in Colossians, we understand that Paul, the writings of Paul, the epistles of Paul are actually that which fulfill, that which complete or make the word of God perfect in its form, as it says there in verse 10, 1 Corinthians 13, 10. But when that which is perfect is come, it's talking about the completion of God's word. So Paul's epistles are actually the epistles that, that do that. And Colossians 1, 25 and 26 tell us that. But the result of that, the result of the mystery given to Paul is faith, hope, and charity, faith, hope, and the love of God, which goes so much deeper than our own personal definition of the word love. So much deeper, in fact, that he uses a different word. He uses the word charity, which, which helps us to understand that there is a depth to that word even greater than me just saying, I love you. When God is exhibiting his charity towards us, it's deeper than that. It's deeper than that, that surface love that we talk about. But faith, hope, and charity remain. Paul gives the pattern for his epistles, and I want you to take note of this. He gives us the pattern for his epistles in 2 Timothy 3, 16. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, actually. And it says this there. It says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect. There's that word again, perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Now, I want you to think about that word perfect there in 2 Timothy 3.17. When it says that the man of God may be perfect. Well, I think I mentioned last week that I had most of my life and still battle this, this uh, idea of perfection. Everything needs to be perfect, 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 perfect order, perfect everything. And if you've ever been to my house on the surface level, there was a time that you would have said, well, everything is just perfect. Everything is just in its place. I can honestly say that I have graduated from that and I realize it doesn't have to be so perfect. When Ronnie and I first got married, I drove him crazy with that perfection. He would leave this cup of coffee right here on the side of his chair and to get up and go do something, thinking that he would come back to that cup of coffee. Oh no, the perfectionist in me would go get that coffee cup, would take it to the kitchen and I would wash and dry and put it away by the time he got back to his chair. Or I would do that with whatever it was, iced tea. And he would say, you know, where's my this or where's my that? 
Well, it's already where it needs to be, right? Because it doesn't need to be left by your chair. Well, he has reformed me somewhat into accepting that, you know what? Everything doesn't have to be perfect. And it's a much easier life when we realize that everything doesn't have to be perfect. You know, when I sign on to these Zoom studies, it's funny because I sign on and I get on here and I turn the camera on and I'm going up and I'm like, okay, you know, is everything, you know, it's just funny how we act like that. It doesn't matter. Those things don't matter. But what does matter here is that Paul gave us a pattern for his epistles in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. So we know that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And, and that tells you that we discard no scripture. We are accused of discarding scripture and not reading, not believing all of scripture, but we do because all scripture from Genesis through the end of Revelation is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And the things that it's profitable for is for doctrine. Doctrine gives us the foundation for how to live what to believe, how to believe, how to how to allow Christ to live in us and through us. Reproof, and a reproof there is basically a scolding or a rebuke. So all scripture is profitable for doctrine, for reproof. It, it, and correction is that next thing. It corrects us. It rebukes us. And it instructs us in righteousness. And the result of that the result of those things is told in 2 Timothy 3, 17, that the man of God may be perfect. So when I want to equate that, I'm not perfect. So in Karen, Karen is by far from perfect. There is no, nothing perfect within my physical being. Matter of fact, it's very imperfect. Uh, the word of God would tell me that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. So that's would pretty much tell me I'm not perfect. Well, right here, it says that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So what does that mean? Well, the only way I can equate that perfection is that I am complete because in my flesh, in myself, I am not perfect. Only in him do I have or exhibit any sign of that because my life, ye are dead and your life is now hid with Christ in God. So the perfection of Christ covers my imperfection in such a way that it completes me. So when I look at that scripture there in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 10, there's lots of controversy over that scripture. Churchianity and many of those just in general will tell you when the word says, but when that which is perfect is come, it's talking about Christ, but it's not. This scripture here is talking about the completion of the word of God. When that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. So we have to equate that word perfect there to the same word that we just read in 2 Timothy 3, 17, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works, complete. We are complete. We cannot be complete until the word of God was complete. So there's a lot of controversy over that, even among some of my own close friends and loved ones that believe that that word means when Jesus returns. And that is not what it means. But I wanted to bring that out because it's important that we understand that the context of where we are, we're going to move into chapter 14, which in the beginnings here, it's going to talk a lot about the spiritual gift at that time of speaking in tongues. And there's a lot of people in the religious world today that still rely on those giftings, not just the speaking in tongues, but they equate that particular gift with your salvation. If you can't speak in tongues, many people would say, then you're not saved. You don't have the Holy Spirit unless you can speak in tongues. That is not the truth. And we have to understand this here in order for us to, to properly apply 
what Paul is teaching. And remember, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished. This is like your toolbox right here, truly furnished unto all good works. Without this, we don't have a complete toolbox, but with it, we have everything we need. And we need to understand that. We don't need what Paul is trying to get these Corinthians to understand is going to pass off the scene. At the time, they needed what they were given. They needed the spiritual gifts. We're going to talk about that a little bit uh, a little bit further today. But so I wanted you to note that um, number one, uh, the 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 pattern given in Paul's epistles there in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. And I also want to share with you one more time. I shared it last week, but I want to share it one more time uh, where these things are found in your scripture, the faith, the hope, the charity. Where do we learn of these things? Where are they found? So um, we learned the, the, the pattern of Paul's epistles. And again, Eric mentions here in the commentary that that word perfect is used as well. Uh, the doctrine of faith. The reason Romans is found first in your in your Bible, as far as the first epistle of Paul recorded, it was not the one, the first one written, but it was the first one in the placement of his epistles is Romans, because that is the doctrine of faith. It's found in Romans. The reproof and correction are found uh, of faith are found in first and second Corinthians. So here we are in first Corinthians and we've we're all the way to chapter 14. So we have discovered a lot of reproof and correction that Paul is bringing to these saints in Corinth. They are carnal. They are in their flesh, but they are saved. And so he's bringing correction and reproof to them in 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians. It's also found that reproof and correction is also found in the book of Galatians. I can recall uh, reading uh, a scripture in Galatians who hath bewitched you? That would be a correction. That would be a reproof, a rebuke to, to, to show them they're not applying the word of God correctly. That's where that is found. First Corinthians, first and second Corinthians and Galatians respectively. The, re, um, the same thing with the doctrine of charity. The doctrine of charity is found in Ephesians through Colossians. The doctrine of hope is found in First and Second Thessalonians. And the instruction in righteousness is found in First Timothy, Second Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. So a similar pattern for Israel's edification is found in Hebrews through Revelation. But for us in the body of Christ, Paul says here in 1 Corinthians 13, 13, and now abideth faith, hope, charity these three but the greatest of these is charity and i wanted us to really hone in on where we learn those things we as the body of christ understand that all scripture is given by inspiration of god we understand we've read it over and over and over that it is profitable we've heard it that it is profitable and that it's for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. And when we finally hone in on that and understand where those things are, how is it broken down in Paul's epistles, then I can read and believe it in the way that I need to read and believe it. And I can glean from it those nuggets, those treasures that are in God's word. And what are those treasures? Wisdom and knowledge. I can I can hone in on that and glean those treasures. So I wanted to kind of, and if you want to know, that's on the bottom of page 123. You can find that, that pattern for Paul's epistles. And you can also find each book where it's broken down and taught. So knowing that Paul's epistles teach the doctrine of faith, charity, and hope, Paul says, now abide it, these three. Once the perfect is come, this verse is yet another proof 
that the perfect that we talked about in verse 10 must refer to the completed word of God. Just like the perfect man refers to the man of God that is complete in him, not in, in ourselves. We are perfect only in him because we are complete in him. So finally, at the end of chapter 13, Paul concludes that verse, verse 13, by saying the greatest of these is charity. We are saved by the faith of Christ. That's Galatians 2.16. Specifically, um, where did I write that? Put it on the wrong page. Galatians 2.16 says this. Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So we are saved by the faith of Christ. That's another controversial subject and one that few people, and I speak for myself as one of the few, understand in churchianity today. Few people understand the faith of Christ versus faith in Christ. There's never a, a, an investigative look at the word of God in Romans when it talks about faith to faith. What does that statement mean? And I believe that's in Romans 1, um, Romans 1 verse 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. And Habakkuk 2 saying the just shall live by his faith. But rarely is there investigation into what that really means. So in religious circles, they've taken that faith and they've made it about our faith. But that faith to faith statement there in Romans 1, 17, it's talking about our faith, then the faith of Christ. And we don't catch that. I spent all of my life up until May the 5th, 2020, believing that it was about me. It was about my faith. The just shall live by faith. Well, that's got to be my faith, right? Wrong. X, wrong. It's by the faith of Christ. Galatians 2.16 mentions the faith of Christ twice in there. So we understand that. Our hope is laid up for us in heaven. The reason charity is the greatest of these is because it is what leads people to believe the gospel. Jesus said in John 13.35, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. Um, Romans 5, 3 through 5, uh, says that tribulation, and we don't like to hear this, but this is the word of God. Tribulation, which comes from faith in God's word, results in hope. And the scripture there says, and hope maketh not ashamed. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. I didn't read a condition there. I didn't read a stipulation that if your flesh, if you in the flesh can speak in tongues, then you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. That's not what the scripture says. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given to us. At what point? When we recognize our sin and trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ as the atonement for that, that's the believing of the gospel at that moment. And it did not manifest itself in any physical form. It didn't change how I looked on the, on the outside when the Holy Ghost took up residence in my heart, in my life. It didn't change that on the outside, but the inside definitely changed. So we can see that faith, hope, and charity, and it is charity that is the result of the faith and hope. So it's the love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts that is the result of that faith and that hope that we have. Then people will see that charity in our lives and desire to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. All I could see 
on Sunday when that young man climbed out of his truck. He had to climb over the seat and climb out the back because the driver's and passenger's door on the front of his truck were wedged into the trailer. They, you couldn't open them. But all I could see was my own son, possibly. And as one of our sisters mentioned, she could see her own son. All I could see was that. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I was so grateful that he was upright. There was not a drop of blood, not a drop of blood. He had a little rash on his forearm where his airbag deployed, but that's so minor and minimal. All I could think about was, thank you, God. Thank you, Lord. And so I had to share that with him. I am grateful. Don't let this learn from this. Yes, but let's be grateful today because we have every reason to be grateful. We are whole. We are not broken. That that's a broken mess, but we are not broken. And people will see that's charity. That's the love of God. Have I had I not had that Holy Ghost in me? Would I have jumped out of my truck in anger? Would I ran back there and said, What are you thinking? You shouldn't even have your driver's license. And I can hear people that have done that. That hot headedness that is only flesh driven. But all I could think about was that young man and what was I going to see when I ran back there and the fact that he could get out and be standing there with me, how grateful I was. I know whether he at his young tender age could verbalize that or not, he saw something different and that's the love of God. That's the charity of God. So people will see that charity in our lives. And I even shared that with his grandparents. His grandparents got there. They didn't know how we were going to be. Were we going to be angry? Were we? They didn't know, but we didn't behave that way. We behaved in the love of God. And that's what they saw. So that's what people will see and desire to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. I may never see that young man again, this side of heaven. But I promise you, he will never forget that day. He will never forget that day. But that is why charity is the greatest of the three. And um, this is also why Ephesians through Colossians, Ephesians through Colossians. What did we say that that shows? Charity. It's the doctrine of charity. Ephesians through Colossians is the most advanced doctrine you will find in Paul's epistles. You want to know how to live with the charity of God exhibited? What did we say that that wisdom is applied knowledge? Well, when we let Christ live through us, that's charity applied. And when we want to know how to, how to do that, Ephesians through Colossians is the most advanced doctrine that we will find in Paul's epistles because it teaches Charity it teaches the love of God and charity. And I underlined this charity is the end result of faith and hope. If I have the faith of Christ and I have the hope, which is not a wish. Hope is that confident expectation that we have. We are privileged to have that in the body of Christ, that confidence expecting, um, it is charity is the end result of that, because when you have that, you cannot help Christ in you. It's like Lisa telling us the story last week of of uh, the, the, the teachings about how not to sin and that Christ in you doesn't sin. Christ in you can't sin. Christ in you can't exhibit anything but the love of God, the charity of God. So when we allow him to do that, that's what he does. So in, in the Hebrew epistles, the same holds true. First John is the most advanced doctrine there because it is also about charity. Because of this, we can understand that charity, the love of God, is the currency of heaven. You know, I'm so glad we're not going to need money there. 
I'm so glad that it's not going to be about my bank account there. And if I can pay my light bill and my house payment and all those little things that we have to pay every month, I'm so glad that the currency of heaven is the love of God. It's the charity of God. And so we ended there. Now abide it, faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Now let's move on to chapter 14. And the very first verse says, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. Now, Paul is going to give us some doctrine here, some teaching here that is profitable for us. But here in the Corinthians, we need to understand those spiritual gifts were still operational. They were still given because the word of God was not completed. So he's having to teach them how to properly use those gifts, not abuse those gifts, not to use them to puff up their flesh, but to use them to edify one another. Earlier on in our lesson, we learned that the purpose of spiritual gifts is to impart spiritual knowledge. The purpose of a spiritual gift is to impart spiritual knowledge. That was needed here in the day of the Corinthians because they didn't have the completed word of God, which contained hidden treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The word of God was still being completed. It was still being written. So that spiritual gift was for the purpose of imparting spiritual knowledge. And Paul says here in chapter 14, verse one, to follow after charity, the greatest of these and desire spiritual gifts, told them it's not wrong to desire spiritual gifts, but rather that ye may prophesy. So here on page 124 in your commentary, Eric says, once the Corinthians have charity, they should desire to prophesy, not speak in tongues. Well, in the modern on the modern front today, obviously not so modern because even in Corinthians, they were desiring the showmanship, the show, the showy flesh gifts because that puffed them up. So Paul had to remind them, follow after love, God's love, follow after charity. The reason and, and desire spiritual gifts, but, but rather that ye may prophesy the reason is that prophecy edifies, prophecy exhorts, prophecy comforts the church, while the tongues, without the proper uh, interpretation, without the proper application, it's not just about interpretation. It's about application as well. And we need to understand that because today I was a part of that movement. And today we may have an interpreter, quote, air quote interpreter, but we don't have the prophet that is required to make sure that that interpretation is the word of God. That's what a prophet did. A prophet determined, even in Paul's epistles, why was prof why were prophets given to the body of Christ? Because those prophets had to determine, is that the word of God? In today's modern churchianity world, on that front, you do not have those elements in place. You have someone speaking in what they say is tongues, and you have someone giving a, an interpretation, but you never have the reproof of that interpretation. You never have the rebuke of it or the correction of it. And quite honestly, the only thus saith the Lord that is applicable today is already here. So this is the prophecy today. This right here, if I want to prophesy, and I should, it is proclaiming, thus saith the Lord. So all I have to do is open the word to Paul's epistles. All I have to do is read the word of God, and that is thus saith the Lord. That's not understood today. It wasn't in the Corinthians. It wasn't done that way because the word of God was still being penned. So I need us to keep that distinction there. And for anybody who has any questions about this, if you're watching this later and you have questions, maybe you're someone who goes to a church that exercises those gifts. I don't want to offend you at all. I want to encourage you to investigate the word of God, rightly divided, to study, 
to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. And if you hear something that sparks something in you that says, what is she talking about? Please put a comment. I, I'm not good about looking at the comments. I'm terrible at it, quite frankly, uh, and I need to get better at it. But if there's a comment, Eric reads it and he'll send it to me just so he makes sure that I get it because sometimes I I just don't. I, I don't get on there and investigate that as I should and I apologize for that. But anyway, if you hear something that just doesn't make sense to you, but it intrigues you because it is the word of God, reach out because it deserves investigation in your walk with Christ. So um, the reason Paul here in verse one says to follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy is because prophecy at the time is what edified the church. Speaking in tongues edified only oneself. And later on, he's going to tell us that it is better for the church to speak five words of prophecy than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue, because no understanding is gained from the tongue talking. So prophets, the conclusion of that is that prophets are more important than tongue talking because they were needed to identify which of Paul's letters uh, were scripture and which were not. You realize that we have two letters, two epistles to the Corinthians, but Paul references in a previous epistle. Paul references a third epistle, but we don't have that. Why? Because the prophets that were given to the body of Christ deemed that that was not something that needed to be included in the inspired word of God. It's referenced, but we don't have it because of the work of the prophet, the true prophet. The true prophet today, well, there is no true prophet. When I say that, I'm talking about, um, you've seen the extremes, talking about those extremes. Oh, um, you in the 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 you're you're covering yourself with a blanket, or you know, this is what you're gonna XYZ. That's not prophecy. And many people hang on that and they hop around seeking that word because they look at that word being from God rather than the word of God being the word of God. So I want us to keep that in mind. So Paul spent chapter 13 describing a more excellent way than the spiritual gifts. And this more excellent way is charity. He says here, follow after charity. He said that the spiritual gifts would pass away once God's word was completed, but that charity would never pass away. First Corinthians 13, eight says charity never faileth. And that faileth there means it's going to be everlasting, last forever. It's never going to pass away. Charity is how heaven will operate for all eternity. Paul spent chapter 13 showing how important charity is. Now he's going to spend chapter 14 showing how important it is to get God's word in the inner man. Remember the pattern for Paul's epistles? It's profitable for doctrine. He wants that doctrine in the inner man. And the only way I can get that doctrine in the inner man is to read and believe it. And then the Holy Spirit will do the job of the Holy Spirit. The word of God will do the work of God if I'm putting it in. And that's just the way it is. God's word needs to be in the inner man and allow Christ to live out that word through us. When reading your Bible, we need to always keep in mind God's twofold will for your life. Number one, it's to be saved. And we know our friends in churchianity, if they've believed the gospel, they're saved. That's not in question here. But the second part of the will of God is to come into the knowledge of the truth. That's where the church today lacks is that knowledge of the truth. So the purpose of spiritual gifts for the Corinthians is for them to come into the knowledge of the truth. It is not for them to feel good. It's not for them to show how spiritual they are. So remember when 1 Corinthians was being penned, the word of God was not completed. So 
God used tongues. He used interpretation. He used prophecy. He used prophets in this time to get the purpose of spiritual gifts out, which is to impart spiritual knowledge. That's how he did that. That's why those gifts are operational to the Corinthians. They are to covet earnestly the best gifts. Chapter 12, verse 31 says, the way they receive the best gifts is by maturing in sound doctrine. It's not by standing up, speaking louder than the one next to them or talking over the one next to them. It's not that because it means they will use their gifts more responsibly. When we mature in sound doctrine, we are more responsible ambassadors for Christ. We cannot grow up in that sound doctrine if we're not putting it in. So the best gift, the conclusion is the best gift must be prophecy because Paul says to covet to prophesy later on in this chapter in verse 39, and we'll get there later. This means that the gift of prophecy is better than miracles. It's better than gifts of healing. It's better than diversities of tongues. In fact, verse 28 in chapter 12, we talked about that order. It gives that order of spiritual gifts and it lists prophets above these gifts. Why? Because prophets speak God's word. They are the thus saith the Lord that is pinned here in our Bible. It's the thus saith the Lord. We are to live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Therefore, once we are saved, the most important thing that we can do is to get God's word in our inner man so that Christ can live through us, through our, our body. Um, and that that charity, that love of God is exhibited and shown to other people. This is why coming into the knowledge of the truth is the second part of God's will for your life. And since the Corinthians did not have God's completed written word, Paul tells them to desire to prophesy because it is that prophesying, that prophecy that was used to get the knowledge of the truth, the word of God completed so that they may learn more of God's word so that Christ can live in them to the greater extent. That's why Paul sells, tells them to desire to prophesy so that they can learn more of God's word. Christ can live in them to a greater extent. But you and I, we have the completed word of God today. And we can read and believe God's word. We have the Holy Ghost within us to teach it to us. We have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians 2.16 tells us we have the mind of Christ. Where is that mind of Christ? Because sometimes this is a runaway. This right here is a runaway. It goes on trails and, and chases things that it shouldn't, shouldn't chase. So, but the word says that we have the mind of Christ. How do I get this mind and that mind to be in sync? This is the mind of Christ right here. I have to read it. I have to believe it. I have to let it do the work of God in my life. That way the decisions are not made by my fleshly mind, but my decisions will then start being transformed into those decisions that are made by the mind of Christ and not by my flesh mind. But Christ lives in us, Galatians 2.20. Chapter 14 here in, in 1 Corinthians is showing the Corinthians that prophecy is more important than tongues. So applied to today, how can we apply that to today? Because you will encounter people who are, I will call them spiritual or religious. I mean, there's so many quote, quote, spiritual things now, nowadays out there. Um, so there's a lot of spiritual people that will get in your face about this issue. So how do we apply that to today when we have God's completed word? The lesson for us is to learn that reading and believing God's word is more important than the emotionalism of worship services, where I can get myself swaying, where I can 
raise my hands. You know what? If I have no problem how how you pray, how you uh, worship the Lord, closing your eyes, whatever that is up to you. But the more important thing that we have than that emotional draw is that draw to the truth. We worship God, not by feeling good. When that kid ran into our trailer, that didn't feel good. It didn't feel good. I didn't raise my hands and stand out there and, and worship God. That wasn't that form of worship that was a form of godliness. And that scripture talks about that too. I didn't rely on feeling good, but exhibiting charity to that young man was worshiping God. It was allowing Christ to live through us. We worship God, John 4, 24 says, in spirit and in truth. And the fact of the matter is, we don't always feel good. We don't always feel good. And still, we worship God in spirit and in truth, even when we don't feel good. This means that we read and believe God's word, which results in the Holy Ghost teaching our spirit the things of God. The truth. The Holy Ghost teaches our spirit the things of God, which is the truth. Bible study is the most important thing today for the edification of the believer. Just like the gift of prophecy was more important in the day of the Corinthians than speaking in tongues. And I want to repeat that. Bible study is the most important thing. It's more important than warming your pew on Sunday morning. It's more important than gathering together in in um fellowship it's more important to your inner man to get that sound doctrine built up bible study is the only way that's why we are given a directive we are not given the great commission or that which is labeled the great commission in mark or in matthew we aren't given that we are given a commission yes but that commission is to be an ambassador for Christ. That commission is to study, to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. That's very different than laying hands on the sick and they shall recover. That's very different than casting out devils in the name of Jesus. That's very different than drinking a deadly poison and it not harming me. That's very different. So I, I will tell you right now, I had a, a, a pastor when he found out that I was having a Bible study, stand in the pulpit on the platform and say to the congregation that the worst thing that you can do is become a part of a home Bible study. Those were his words. And I wasn't there that Sunday because my grandbaby was born and I was in California. And so he chose that day to bring this up, but I was told about it. So I listened to it and those were his words. When, is that not the farthest thing from the truth? When the word of God has commissioned us, Paul, our apostle, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit has commissioned us to study. I'm sorry, but my Bible didn't just get opened when I was in that church building. I'm sorry, but when ladies asked me to facilitate a Bible study, I said, yes, I'm not sorry. I'm sarcastically saying that, but for him to say that home Bible study is the worst thing that a person can do is an absolute ridiculous statement. It goes against what we are told to do in the word of God. Bible study is the most important thing today for edification of the believer. So if you want to follow a man, a pastor, I wouldn't have been doing this today. If I listened to that, I wouldn't be doing this today. Think about that. And, and I know that for myself, the gleaning is way more on my part than I, than it could ever be to you because that's how it works. And there are days I feel like 
oh my goodness, I just don't know that I'm prepared. I don't know that I, 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 and God has to remind me, it's a good thing it's not about you. It's a good thing there's no I in God. It's a good thing it's all about him. It's all about the faith of Christ in me. It's not about me. And I have to remind myself of that. Even when I think, well, I just don't know. Maybe, you know, we try not to let things affect us in, in the natural realm. Like maybe we have just a few people sign on, or maybe we don't have anybody. Maybe I just have one, you know, I try not to let that affect me, but it does affect me in the natural, in the physical, in the flesh, it does. And so I think, well, maybe I don't need to do this anymore. Maybe I don't. Well, if I listen to that man, I would have, I would have fallen right into that and not have continued, not have pursued the study of God's word. So Bible study today is the most important thing that you can do to edify the believer, just like the gift of prophecy here in 1 Corinthians is more important than the speaking in tongues. I wish that everybody could hear that. All of my precious friends, sisters, and brothers even in Christ that are so holding on to that. I wish they could hear that. So 1 Corinthians 14, let's move on to verses 2 and 3. It says this, For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God, for no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. Hear that again. But he that prophesieth, he that speaketh the thus saith the Lord. He is the one that speaketh unto men to edification, to exhortation and comfort. How are we exhorted today? How are we edified today? How are we comforted today? By the thus saith the Lord, by the word of God. So it's still, even though he's speaking to them in the realm of spiritual gifts, it still holds true today, but he, isn't it interesting? Eric uses the group Pentecostals because that's where it's most widely known as far as the speaking in tongues. They desire to speak in tongues. Now I wasn't a Pentecostal. I was a um, really non-denominational, um, but the pastor had a church of God background, which was very big in that gifting. So there's many more than just the Pentecostal movement, but in that movement and in others, the desire is to speak in tongues because they are speaking the mysteries in the spirit. That's what verse two says, for he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto man, but unto God, for no man understandeth him, Howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. However, and I heard that over and over and over. Uh, the encouragement of speaking in tongues was so every week, every moment that when you walked up to the church, the door, all you could hear was all this chaos and confusion. You couldn't understand a word that anybody was saying because everybody was speaking at the top of their lungs in the quote, quote spirit. So, but nobody could understand that. And many people driving by or passing by probably walked right on by because that's kind of a scary situation. Paul preached Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, which is was kept secret since the world began. That's Romans 16, 25. But yet the people who want to hold on to that tongue gift say that they are speaking mysteries in the spirit, but yet they disregard the revelation of the mystery that Paul teaches in his epistles. That's pretty interesting to me. Um, and many times they don't want to have anything to do with Paul's epistles. Why? Because speaking in tongues is an outward manifestation of the spirit that makes them look good in the flesh. I had to grasp that. I had to really cogitate on that for a long time. Was what I was doing, was it truly to edify my flesh? Or was it to edify God? And that was a soul searching question for me because I was entrenched in that. 
I was steeped in it. I used my tea glass or my teacup last week, I think on uh, Thursday evening doing that during an example, I had tea, a tea, two tea bags actually in a cup and I didn't take a sip of it until the end of the lesson. Well, by the end of the lesson, that tea was thoroughly steeped into the water. So it was no longer water, it was tea. So I was steeped in that, in that religious practice. Um, but it was a form of godliness. And I, and when I truly looked deeply at it, it was a flesh edification. It wasn't edifi edification in any other way. Honestly, nobody could understand it. So how could it be edifying? And that's what happens today. That manifestation of the spirit that comes out in what people consider talking in tongues makes them look good in the flesh. While the mystery that Paul preached that was revealed through the Apostle Paul is good for us spiritually. Remember, in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, but the word says that I am perfect in him, complete in him. But that's spiritual, not physical. So because there's none righteous, Romans 3.10 says there's none righteous. No, not one. So purposely, and I say that purposely loosely in a, in a sense, because when I was steeped in that, I didn't realize that's what I was doing. I didn't realize that until the knowledge of the truth was revealed to me and I had a choice to make. I was either going to come out of that and denounce that as an untruth, or I could have stayed in it to puff myself up. Well, there was only one answer for me. I had to come out of it. So I don't necessarily know that there is a purposefulness in the average churchgoer because they think they're doing right. They think that they're glorifying God. They think that it's for the church, but it says here that they purposely discard the gospel that saves them today for the appearance of righteousness. What was the last thing in the pattern for Paul's epistles that Paul's epistles does? It's instruction in righteousness. So even that, when I think that it makes me appear righteous, the only righteousness I have is in him. Number one, we are made the righteousness of Christ. We are the righteousness of Christ. And, and that's, that's what it is. So um, when I do those things in the flesh, there is an appearance of righteousness. That's what was happening here in Corinthians. The Corinthians were carnal. Remember the title of our study, carnal saints. And they were carnal as well, which is why they also liked the tongue talking the best. It was something that they could do and make themselves feel spiritual. And, and verse 28 in chapter 12 shows that the order of importance, speaking in tongues is the least important spiritual gift. We talked about that a little bit earlier. So if you speak in tongues, only God understands what you are saying. Therefore, the only way the body of Christ is edified is if God tells someone with the gift of interpretation what was actually spoken in tongues. And then a prophet confirms that is a word from the Lord. You see that process? You don't see that in today's church. Now, there were times that there would be a, it was this, the tongues would differ. Um, like we would be praying before services and he wanted us all to be praying in the spirit, speaking in tongues and all out loud, all over one another. There's never, you know, never an interpretation of any of that. But then if there was a time during a service that someone started belting out something in a babble that sounded exactly like what was prayed in, then there might be someone wait a few minutes and somebody say what the interpretation was. Well, it's just not in order. It's not in order. And when we really put it side by side with the word of God, we can see those differences. 
and we can see that it is not what is supposed to happen today. And then the prophet confirming that that is a word from the Lord. So Eric says here, however, if you have enough faith to have the gift of prophecy, the two middlemen can be eliminated. And that's what Paul was trying to tell them. Desire to prophesy. You don't need the interpreter. You don't need um, the, the confirmation. If you desire to prophesy, you are speaking direct the, the thus saith the Lord. You can speak God's word directly. This is why Paul says that no man understandeth him who speaketh in an unknown tongue while a prophet speaks the word of God that everyone can understand, which results in edification, exhortation, and comfort. That's what verse three there says. So we should note here that the gift of tongues changed when it was given to the mystery dispensation. And I want us to hear this as well. Tongues were first given to Israel in Acts chapter two. Now I was brought up in an Acts two church, not where the gifting of tongues came, but where the repent and be baptized came in. We, I was raised in a church that did not exercise those spiritual gifts, but it was a requirement that you repent and be baptized. There in Acts chapter two, they spoke with other tongues and everybody heard that tongue in their own language. That's a key there wherein they were born. So if, if I was born in, I don't know, another, another country that did not have English as its language, um, I would have heard that word being spoken in that language that I understood. So in Israel's program, tongues were a sign gift. Um, believing Israel spoke and the others heard the speech in their own language, even though believing Israel did not know those languages. That was a true gift of tongues. When tongues were given to the mystery dispensation, people spoke in a language only known by God. This then required the gift of interpretation for people to understand it and a prophet to say if it was from the Lord or not. So lots of things discarded in today's movement of speaking in tongues and other giftings. So in doing so, tongues accomplished two purposes here. First, they were assigned to unbelieving Israel that God was with the Gentiles now, which uh, was meant to provoke Israel to jealousy. That's the entire reason that these gifts were given to, to provoke Israel to jealousy. Second, they helped in the maturity of the members of the body of Christ as it showed them that God could use them in a greater capacity as they matured spiritually. So remember that those giftings were given according to the measure of faith. So as you matured spiritually speaking, that's why tongue speaking in tongues was the least gift. It was given to you when your faith was not, it was a, your faith had not matured as your, the maturity level of your faith was given or was gained, the different gift was given. That's why the measure of of the, the gift was given according to the measure of your faith. So thus tongues were used as a sign in Israel's program and were used for growing in spiritual wisdom in the mystery program. And this is in line with the statement in chapter one, first Corinthians chapter one, verse 22, that says the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. So in these first three verses, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts. So he's telling the Corinthians, desire these things, you should desire them, but rather that ye may prophesy. So he is categorizing those gifts on a level there. For he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. Verse three, but he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification and exhortation and comfort. Verse four, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. Sounds pretty fleshy to me, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. 
So what is the what is the end goal? To edify yourself, to puff up yourself, to feel good, to get the Holy Ghost goosebumps. What is the end game there? Or is it to edify the body of Christ? We're fixing to have a conference the first weekend in December. And there are many conferences that take place throughout the year. There are many studies on a weekly basis that take place daily. Every day you could sign on to somebody's rightly divided Bible study. So there's lots of opportunities for that edification and, and building up of the body of Christ. But when we go to that conference, every we are going to leave that conference so full, so full because we are going to be edified um, as the body of Christ, the church, the body of Christ. We should note that usually the word edifieth is used to signal an increase in spiritual understanding. And when we read and believe the word of God, that's what happens. We get an increase. We gain an increase in spiritual understanding. So at first glance, this verse may seem to say that the tongue talkers grow, grow in spiritual understanding by speaking in tongues. So one might argue that tongue talking is good because it has at least some spiritual benefit. It says it edifies yourself, basically. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. So one might argue that that is spiritual benefit to yourself. However, verse 14 puts this argument to rest by saying, if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth. And we're not here yet, but I'm going to say this, but my understanding is unfruitful. So that means that the edification of the tongue talker is not in his soul. Let me repeat that. Verse four, he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself. So the argument could be that you're edifying yourself spiritually when you speak in tongues. However, if you flip the page, as in my Bible, verse 14 says, for if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. So this means that the edification of the tongue talking is not in the soul. Therefore, today we could ask ourselves, so what is the point of that? So tongues do not edify the tongue talking, except that it gives him the opportunity to use it responsibly so that the Holy Ghost can entrust him with a better gift later on. Unfortunately, the Corinthians were using tongue talking to puff up their flesh rather than grow in the spirit. I told the story of when I was steeped into that movement. When we would go into the church, and there were some here, even on this call today, that were a part of that. We would go into the church, and the 30 minutes before church started was a time of prayer. And people were walking all over the, the sanctuary the pastor had a microphone and usually his wife had a microphone. And so, and it was blaring. It was loud, loud, loud. And he was screaming into this microphone in tongues. And he was telling you to pray in tongues, pray in tongues. So you had not only the blaring from the microphone, but you had everybody else doing the same thing. What was that doing spiritually? Absolutely nothing. Nothing. What is the purpose of a spiritual gift to impart spiritual knowledge? Today, we have the knowledge contained in the word of God. But if we wanted to use that stance, well, we did that because it's edification, it's comforting. No. It's not, you can't be understood. It's not interpreted. It's not anything. It's just a bunch of babble going on. It's chaos. And the end of this chapter, it's going to tell us in verse 40, let all things be done decently and in order. None of that was done decently and in order. 
and the spiritual knowledge was was negative there was no spiritual knowledge imparted by that act so i look back on it now and i realize that so verse 4 here when it says he he that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself but he that prophesieth edifieth the church it explains why that movement today emphasizes tongue talking over prophesying tongue talking builds up the talk, tongue talkers flesh while prophesying builds up the church uh, the soul of the church tongue talking today is nothing more than a flesh contest that's a hard pill to swallow for people who are steeped in that but that is thus saith the lord that is thus saith the lord so by speaking in tongues more than the other person the tongue the one doing it appears to be more spiritual or more godly than the others remember i think it's in timothy we're taught we're, we're taught about that form of godliness that's what it is it's a form of godliness to try to make yourself on a higher level than the other person if you really want to be godly you need to spend those hours reading and believing and applying God's word to your life. Remember, wisdom is knowledge applied. If we want to apply God's word to our life, we have to spend time in it. We have to read it. And, and if you want to only appear godly, then you can babble like a baby. That's what it sounds like. And, and ignorant brethren, those who are following you. I was an ignorant brethren. And I say that with admission of that. I was ignorant. I placed that pastor so far above me, spiritually speaking, because of that. And, and the only reason I did that was because I was ignorant. I was ignorant to the truth. Was I saved? Had I, did I believe the gospel of Jesus Christ? Yes, but I was ignorant. I had not come into the knowledge of the truth. I had come into the knowledge that that pastor spoke to me. I did not study it. I studied it on the surface level. But the word of God says that in it are hidden treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That means you have to go into it. You know, when it, when, I don't know if any of you followed years ago, the Titanic, you know, when the Titanic movie came out and then they had all these documentaries on, on people getting in these apparatuses to go down to the wreckage of the Titanic. They went deep. They went deep to find a spoon, a teacup, whatever wreckage, whatever treasure that was left from the Titanic. People spent thousands of dollars, many hours, digging out those treasures from the Titanic. Well, the word of God says that hidden here are treasures of knowledge and wisdom. So just like that, I don't need to sit at the foot of a pastor or of a man. I need to dig into the word of God. Let the Holy Ghost teach it to me as I read it and believe it then those treasures of wisdom and knowledge are imparted unto me. Why? Because the word of God does the work of God when I do that. It's not me standing up there thinking so highly of somebody else because they're speaking and what they're telling me is a tongue and I can never understand it. And it sounds the same week after week. It's the same phrases. It's the same, I listened and I'm thinking, okay, well, maybe I should say those same phrases. Maybe I should say those same things. That's what happens because it's a flesh. It's a show in the flesh. So I need to understand that. That babbling like a baby. When you have an ignorant brethren, as I was, it leads us down a place to not fulfill the, the, the will of God in our life. We may be saved, but if we stay locked into that mindset, we'll never come into the knowledge of the truth because we will stay in our ignorance. Um, 
And people in that movement, if we fall into that trap, will start to elevate us just like I elevated that pastor. It's, 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 it's a no win. I was not growing there, even though I thought I was, I was not. So let's move on to verse five. Verse five says, Paul says, I would that ye all spake with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied for greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. Again, I'll say this here. This is a chapter. This is a word that a lot of people do not want to hear. But if I want to study the word of God, this is the word of God. Karen did not write this. You did not write this. This was penned by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. So at the time that Paul wrote this epistle, tongue talking was speaking God's word in a spiritual language that no man understood. It then required someone with the gift of his interpretation to speak the words in a language, for us it would be in English, that we can understand. A prophet was simply someone who spoke God's word. It does not matter or it did not matter if he was foretelling the future events or not. In fact, there are no future events. I want, to, I want you to hear this. There are no future events to foretell in the current mystery dispensation. If I had a megaphone, I would say it on a megaphone. There are no future events to foretell in the current mystery dispensation. But there, it was not completed. So there was that. So then speaking in tongues plus interpretation of tongues equaled prophecy. Today, we don't have that. If you want to read and believe God's word, you will realize that there's no new prophecy being written. The word of God given by inspiration of the Holy Spirit is complete. So this explanation is substantiated by this verse because Paul says greater is he that is uh, that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues except he interpret. In other words, the person with the gift of speaking in tongues and the gift of the interpretation of tongues does the same thing as a prophet. That's why Paul says, okay, I, I wish that you all spoke in tongues, but rather that you prophesy. He said in verse one, follow after charity and desire those spiritual gifts, but rather that you prophesy. Why? Because it takes the tongue and the interpretation of the tongue and puts it into one prophet, prophecy. So, we need to understand that speaking in tongues plus interpretation of tongues equal prophecy in this day or in the Corinthians day. So um, we need to remember that. Um, and that greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret. So the tongues do the same thing as a prophet. So now Paul does not want all of the Corinthians or he does want, I'm sorry, all the Corinthians to speak in tongues because here it shows that they are saved. This is assuming that they are not faking it. Now, we have people today in that movement that still use that as the criteria for salvation. They don't believe you're saved. They don't believe that you have the Holy Spirit unless you have the speaking in tongues. So Paul wanted all of the Corinthians to speak with tongues because it did show that they were saved. In fact, Paul himself speaks in tongues more than the Corinthians do. And he's going to tell us that later in this chapter because he uses the gift more responsibly than they do. However, he prefers that they prophesy rather than speak in tongues when the Corinthians meet together so that the whole church is edified. And he will later tell us that in the church, we mentioned this earlier, I had rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice, I might teach others also than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. You know, I got a letter one time. It was more than a letter. It was a booklet. When I printed it off, it was a booklet. And it was from a pastor. Um, and in that letter, he recorded how many words 
he had typed in the letter. And I'll never forget it. It was 12,835 um, words, 12,835 words. And so when I have a visual example of 12,800 words. So um, when Paul says here that, that he would rather speak ten, uh, five words in his understanding than 10,000 words um, in an unknown tongue, I have that visual that I can apply that to. I can totally understand what that pastor had to say to me could have been said in such a fewer word form. Leave and don't come back. <laughs> you know, five words, leave and don't come back. That's all he would have had to say. But no, he attacked me and my husband and another couple um, through his 12,835 words. Unbelievable. But why does Paul say that he would rather speak five words in, in with my understanding so that he would have a voice to, to teach others than 10,000 words in an un, unknown tongue? The gift of prophecy is what edifies the church. We can only be edified by that which we can understand. So the gift of tongues edifies the tongue talker, lifts, lifts up the tongue talker, puffs them up. That's what makes the prophet, because the prophet can edify others greater than the tongue talker. It's, it's far better that we edify each other. Eric gives a situation here, and it's part of his own story. And if you don't have the book, Life in Christ, What Every Christian Needs to Know, Eric talks a lot about his own story in that book. And um, it's very interesting, and it's 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 moving to you. If you get it, I would, I would recommend it. But he says here that in his childhood church, tongue talking was common during corporal prayer. Uh, and also after each message in the nighttime services. And after those messages, there would be an altar call, which was really not meant for the unsaved people to be saved because it was rare. Eric said that they would have visitors uh, at the nighttime services. If we did, he said, the, those visitors would think that they were mad or crazy. Rather, the altar call was used as an opportunity for the church to speak in tongues, very much like I shared the morning time uh, services were used for us. The service was not over until everyone was done speaking in tongues. Now, this is kind of a comical little story here. Uh, there was one particular lady, and I, when I read this in Eric's book, I can picture Eric's face saying this story. There was one particular lady who would often pray in tongues for 30 minutes longer than everyone else. And so she was keeping people from going home uh, since everyone was supposed to pray for the people who were speaking in tongues that God would continue to bless them. Finally, that book right there, Maria. Uh, finally, the pastor got tired of not getting much sleep. And so he told her to stop talking in tongues for so long. This shows that there was no edification from the tongue talking for the church as a whole. That bears out this scripture here that we're talking about. There was no edification. So the pastor tells her, listen, you're going to have to tone it down a little bit. Stop all this tongue talking. Um, and this was in a church that exalted tongue talking. Isn't that funny? I mean, he says, what's funny is that if someone else told someone not to talk in tongues for so long, he would be accused. And we heard this many times of quenching the spirit, because when a person is speaking in tongues, that's considered the movement of the spirit in their life. So, um, it, it does not come, but but what, what we need to understand is that edification doesn't come from that. Edification to the church doesn't come from that. The pastor told this woman to stop. That speaks volumes. That speaks volumes. Well, the next scripture that we're, we're coming to is verse six, and it's a question. And Paul says, 
Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with tongues, what shall I profit you? Except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine. That is a good question for today's church. That question right there, 1 Corinthians 14, 6. And that verse shows that spiritual profit only comes by the word of God because man shall not live by bread alone. Matthew 4, 4 says, man shall live by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. So Paul says that profit comes by a few things here. It comes by revelation. It comes by knowledge. It comes by prophesying. And it comes by doctrine. It does not come by speaking in tongues, healing people, working miracles, or feeling the presence of God or the moving in the spirit. He doesn't say he tells you exactly what it comes from. What shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? Where do we have revelation, knowledge, um, prophecy, and doctrine? We have it completed today in the word of God. Those gifts are not operational today because of that we have that which is perfect that which is complete so today when we read these words in first corinthians we understand the context of them who they were spoken to and for what purpose and they're profitable today for those of us who have been steeped into that same type of religious practice that is not edifying to the body of christ so we're going to stop right there before we move on into the rest. Uh, we'll start with um, basically verse seven next week. So Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, Lord, that if we will just study it, Father, we can trust your word. We can trust the Holy Spirit in us to teach us your word. We don't have to measure up to some standard set by another organization or another person um father because we are complete in you we can trust that the word of god will do the work of god in our life if we will but study it and put it in father i thank you today for salvation i thank you father for the twofold will of god in our lives that that we be saved but I thank you, Father, also that you have made a way for us to come into the knowledge of the truth. So as we depart this place today, I pray, Father, that we will each and everyone understand Christ in us and that the charity of God is lived out by Christ through us. Father, we thank you for this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.